everyone, and welcome to today's SQL Office Hour session. It's always great to be here and help answer your questions about SQL. And today we're going to be looking at an interesting topic and something that crops up every now and again. So you've probably heard about SQL window functions or analytic functions, and they're interesting because they're different to a lot of other operations in SQL and that they can go across rows. So some of you may be wondering, well, how do you know exactly which rows they include? You know, you can see what the total is, you can see what the output is, but you can't necessarily see which rows they're actually including in the results. So what we'll do in this session is we're going to use the power of Oracle Analytics Cloud to show you when you've got a query and it's running, which rows are included in that total, depending on what you put in the various clauses that are available there. So hi, everyone. I'm Chris Saxon. I'm part of Gerald Wenzel's developer advocate team. It's my job to help you get the best out of Oracle database and hopefully have a little bit of fun whilst doing so. I've also got to help me here with the SQL visualizations and the analytics cloud stuff. Christian Berg, who's the next Oracle Ace director, you can say hi. Hello, Holly the US. Yeah, I won't have as much to say as Chris today. <laughs> yeah. you, you technical support, right? You, if, when everything breaks, you're... <laughs> yes, um, I must say it's thanks to him that this is all actually working <laughs> because um, we, we had some interesting challenges getting this up and running, shall we say, right? Um, okay, so with that in mind, what we're actually going to do is pretty much just go run straight into a demo here and show you how this works works so let's just let's just get rid of my slides for a second and what i've got over on the left here is i've got um some queries that i'm going to run and over on the right i'm going to hopefully i'll try at least to show how the row the totals are calculated for each row in my result set and we're going to start off nice and simple and build it up as we go along so a few things and notes on the query itself before we get into them. So first thing we note here, we've got this sum. So this is our function and we've added the over clause, which turns it into a window or analytic function instead of a grouping function. So this preserves all the rows in the result set, whereas typical sum or count will just squash down to a row per group. Now at this point, some of you are probably looking at this and kind of thinking, hang on a second, What's this window thing? I've not seen that before. What's going on there? So this is new 21C syntax in Oracle Database. And it's just it's syntax sugar. It's simplification. It makes it easier to see what's actually going on here. And really, it's kind of shorthand. So you can see I've defined my window W. And what this allows me to do is factor it out, define it once, and use it multiple times. So in effect, I, you can think of this as copying that partition bind clause and pasting it into the overlay clause. This is going to become much more helpful later on if the examples get more complicated. So we can see which uh, we can focus on what's actually different between them rather than just having to paste out the whole of these clauses every single time. Um, so as I say, we're starting here with the partition by clause. And if I run this query, um, what this is doing is splitting up the rows into groups with the same value for this group column. So you can see that all the rows with the same value for this group column have the same value for the sum and the count here. So 10 and three in this instance. And this is probably the easiest one of these to understand. So if we go over here, what I'm showing here is you can think of this um, kind of in the middle here, original data set as the actual table itself. And over on the right, the far right, I'm showing which column or which rows, I should say, are included in this total. So when I've got my first row here, window ID one, it's got the sum of five and a count of two, which rows comprise that total? Well, it's these ones here, one and four, because they have the same value for this group column. So you see, if we go to row four as well, again, it's highlighted the same ones. And we look at two and three and five, they all have the same group, so they're all highlighted, and six is off in a group on its own, so that's out there all by itself. So that's partition by, splits the rows out into groups, uh, separate groups and calculates the subtotals within them. 
as I said, unlike traditional um, aggregate functions, which would squash these down, so we just get three rows in the output, once for each one for each value, one, two, and three, we get all six rows in the result set. So that's partitioning. Let's, oh, let's see, there's a question. Could you show the first query as it would be written pre-21C? Um, just, just very quickly, I mean, literally, if we just replace that W with those values there like that and hide, get rid of that window clause, is exactly the same as that. Like I say, just take whatever this definition is and stick it in here, All right? So this is what you would write out. As you can see, it, it shortens what we're doing quite considerably. Um, and this is going to be very, very useful <laughs> as we get further down in, in the session. Okay. So, um, so that's partitioning, split them up into different groups. Let's now look at sorting. So what I'm doing is ordering by the sort columns. So let's just bring up the order by panel and we'll run the query here. And we're going to get running totals for them. And you can see I've actually got um, three different ways to define these. So there's three different ways we can define the frame in terms of number of rows, a range of value, or a number of groups. Um, and groups, again, is another new 21C thing. So if you haven't seen that before and you're going, what is this thing? Again, don't worry, that's new 21C. It is very useful in some cases. Um, I'll talk a bit more about those in a minute. So again, we've got our sorting by um, the sort column, hopefully fairly straightforward, and then adding these rows, range, or groups. So unbounded proceeding is also shorthand for um, unbounded proceeding and current row. So include everything before the current row. However, as we'll see in a second, it can also include rows after the current row. Okay, so you can see we've got our, our running totals here, but you'll notice that um, for some of them, for these range and groups, the running total doesn't actually increase. It stays the same for every for some of these rows, the first three of these, those two, and those ones. Same for the count. So how does this work? Well, if we go over here um, to our visualization. We can see start with rows. Rows is the easiest one. It means only include the rows that appear before the current one in the result set. So we're on the first row. We've just got one row. And as we work our way down, you can see we're adding one row to the result set each time. So we're increasing um, how many rows we're adding. However, what's with this range in groups? They already include the two rows after it in the result set. So what's going on here? Well, range means include all the rows which have a value less than or equal to the current row. So we're sorting by sort column one. That's not unique, right? Um, so we include all the rows which have this value one for the sorting. So that's these um, three after two after it, I should say. And groups means all the ones which have the same value as the current and again, all previous values. So we'll see in the next one, the difference between range and groups in a bit more clearly. But in this case, they actually highlight all the same ones. Um, so if we go to row four, again, because four and five have two for the sort column, both range and groups include four and five in the total. So as I flip back and forth between them, hopefully you can see that the rows is changing, but the range and groups are staying static. They are constant. And it's only when we get to six that we include all the rows in the result set. So, so that's sorting things and we're getting things as we go along. Let's move on now to the next one. Order by um, one preceding and one following. So, so far, we just said include everything up to the current row and the same value as it, depending on what frame we define, rows, range, or group. We can also define sliding windows as an offset from the current row. So rows before or rows after the current one and the number of rows we're defining. So what we're saying here is between one preceding and one following. So what exactly that means, again, depends on whether we use rows, range, or groups. So with rows, it means exactly, or at most one row before, and at most one row after. Range is the number of values. So anything um, from the current value minus one 
and plus one in that range um, inclusive. Groups is the number of distinct values. Um, and we'll see the range different between range and groups more clearly in a second as we work through this. So let's see, as we get these um, results here, you can see we, we end up with more of a sliding window. We end up with lots of rows which have the same value. So if we go back up over here and we're including with rows, one before or after the current, before or after. So with our rows at the top here, we're going to include at most three in the results set. You can see the window kind of slides up and down as I flip through. But range and group seem strangely static, don't they? They seem strangely stuck. So well, what's going on here? Well, it's the same as when we had current row. With range, we're saying include all the values um, up to one greater or one less than the current one, inclusive. So we're on row one, add one to one and you get two. So we include rows four and five in the output here. So you can see those down here. Um, now groups is similar, but subtly different. It's saying how many um, distinct values are there. It's not looking at the actual difference in the values and saying just how many unique ones that are. So at this point, we've got value one, and value two, there are two unique values. We're saying include one unique value after the current. So we move down to four, um, we can hopefully, we'll see a bit more detail what's different between range and groups. So with range, um, we're saying include everything two plus one. So up to the value three, six has the value four for our sort, so it's excluded. However, there is only one, four is the next value after the current. So it is the next group after the current. So groups includes four, whereas range excludes it. And if we go down to six, again, let's make there's a difference here. Two is the previous value before um, four in the sort here. So groups includes it. However, range says four, take away one, you get three. No rows have the value three, so range does not include any values. So this is the kind of thing that can be very useful when you want to do like moving averages, like three day moving averages, seven day moving averages, that kind of thing. And sometimes you want to do it on an exact calendar days. You want to say up to last Tuesday or up to last Wednesday, depending on you know what you consider the frame to be. So you're always um, at most seven calendar days. However, there's lots of types of businesses which have regularly have non-trading days, days when they're just closed completely. Uh, stock exchanges are probably one of the big examples. They're closed at weekends, plus on some public holidays and that kind of thing. So if you want the last three or the last seven trading days, you you can have you can have gaps in your data. You know, um, if you go from Friday, or, or you know, you're calculating on Monday back the three previous trading days, you're actually including the Friday, Thursday, and Wednesday before it. Whereas the three previous calendar days are actually Sunday, Saturday, and Friday. Right. So range includes those calendar days. Um, groups includes those trading days. So the days when if there's days when I are not in the result set, missing values, groups include them, but range excludes them. So I'll just kind of flip backwards and forwards between them again a bit, hopefully make that clear. So hopefully this is kind of making it a bit more um, visible and understandable what the difference is between these. Any questions or comments on these um, before we start going a bit further and ramping it up on, on even, even more? I think it's just it's like stunned silence everywhere. It's just like, <laughs> you know. Yeah, chat and Q&A are also silent. So at the moment, we're good, I think. Yeah, I think I think we're fine. But <laughs> it's either it's like so amazing, no one, everyone understands clearly or nobody's paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. All right. So this time, so this is where we've got a sliding window, one before and one after. The current row, one preceding and one following. And one of the things you'll notice is we've always included all the possible rows we could. 
Okay, so what I'm going to do for the next one, if we just focus on this rows um, frame for now, so at most include one row before or after, and you can see you get the sliding window working its way down the, up and down the data set as I flip through. In 21C, we added another um, clause to this syntax here, this exclusion clause, and we've got various options for this. So this allows us to remove rows from the result set. Um, so I'll show how this works. Now, to start off with, you know, we've got this exclude no others. This is the default. So this first line here is exactly the same as I'm showing on the top right here with this row. So that's just the default clause we've got. So they work in the same way. Um, so I'm not going to include that in the visualization in the next slide, just to kind of preserve space and hopefully make things plausible, a bit more plausible to understand. Um, I'm going to focus on these other ones, exclude current row, ties, and group. So if we run that query, we see we get various results here. And you see, interestingly, we've now got some totals which are in fact null. That's because they've they're processing no rows in the results whatsoever. And we do the same for the count as well. There's nothing in that group. They have a count of zero, and ties have zero as well. So let's see how these work. So remember, we're doing rows. So at most one row before or one row after the current. So let's see which ones we include. So start with current row. Exclude yourself from the result set. That's probably the easiest one to understand. So basically, we'll have the row either side of the current row. Um, so as you work our way down the data set, you can see there's kind of a, we've got this little gap appearing in the results. Um, so exclude yourself from the results. However, we can also state what we're going to exclude in a different way. We can exclude ties. So that means exclude any rows which have the same value for the sort column. So you can see with rows one and two, it only includes itself because the rows either side have the same value for it. So those are not included in the result set. It's only when we move to three and it has a different value for the sorts that we then actually include that in the results. Um, and you see actually three and four both include the same rows for ties because they are excluding one before or after it as appropriate. Um, moves five and again excludes four and six. It, it's just as the previous one. So ties is all the other rows which have the same value for the sort column. So in this case, one. Group works a bit different. And you'll notice it's actually empty in a lot of these, you know, a couple of these examples. It includes nothing whatsoever. Um, and that is because it is excluding all the rows which have that value for the sort column. So the first two rows, the ones before and after it, have the same value. They're in the same group. So they are removed from the result set. It's only when we get to three that we include four, and four then goes back and includes three. Um, five includes the group after it, six, and six uh, um, includes the group before it. So again, this is another, um, it's a 21C um, implementation. It's, you know, this is probably one thing it's a bit more nice to have. The groups frame is something there's definitely times I could I can see I think that would have been pretty handy. Exclusion frame, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure there's use cases for it. Um, I don't know if there's anything you've got, Christian, where you thought that excluding yourself or other rows would have been particularly handy. Um, yeah, the business the business use case. I mean, there are some. When you sent me these examples, I started thinking about some, but for for the life of me, I couldn't remember one where you would exclude yourself. I think the only thing would be if you're working with a result set that's actually person-based uh, and your own records are in there. Yeah, That's basically the only thing that I came up with. But uh, then anyway, you would be you know, in a very specific situation in, in terms of uh, data protection. Mm -hmm. Yes, very, very true. Uh, it's, um, I mean, it's, it's one of these things, it's, it's in the SQL standards and someone has come up with some, gone, that, that would be useful in some, scenarios, but personally, I don't see too many uses for this one. 
All right then, so that is sorting. So we've seen, um, we started off with partitioning. So basically split up the rows into different groups and just consider all the rows in that group. We've had sorting, so include like a running total or a moving window, include either everything up to yourself um, or include a limited number of rows before and after yourself. And again, how we define what those rows are depends on whether you say it's rows, range or groups. We can now take this a bit further and combine them into, <laughs> into one so we can do partitioning and grouping at the same time in the same query. So here we go. Um, let's do that in the next one. So this is when we've got partitioning and sorting. So we split them up into groups according to the group column and then we sort within that group according to the sort column. So we can see what's included there in, in that. Um, and this then has a slightly subtle, but again, it affects which rows were included. So let's jump back, uh, move on to my, my next demonstration here. So this is when we are splitting up by group and then ordering by the sort. And again, we've got rows, range and group. And this time we're doing everything previous up to including the either the same row, same group, same value as the current. Um, so start off with the first row that's in group one um, and all of them included. Now, if we go to the second row, that is in a new group. So we don't include the previous one because we split up by group column first. Um, so that's just kind of completely separate and then we sort by it. And see with rows, we only include rows previous to this in the results, so that that's just one row, but range and group again, include a row after the current in, in the total because the sort column is the same and not unique values here. So we can see that two and three change for rows, but not for range and group because the sort, sorting is non-unique here. Um, go to four, that's in the same group as row one. So at this point, all of them include it. Five, actually the results here are the same for all of them. And again, six is in a group on its own. So that resets the group and the total like that. So we can split things up and then have separate groupings within them. Within them. Um, this is the kind of thing where it could be useful if you want to split things up by customer or by product. You know, when you want to get the customer's running total of sales or the product's running total of sales per day, you might want to have really different ones. And I think this is where the window clause is starting to show its really usefulness because, of course, if I had to paste these into all of here instead of W, you can see it's starting to get, you know, a quite wordy, tricky to follow. And of course, there's a real chance I would have made some mistake and you know, accidentally typed it wrong at some point. Um, so this is, it's a simple thing, but I think this is a really nice, really useful thing to have. So I see there's a couple of, couple of things. Uh, wordy, but still works. Yes, exactly. It still works. I think it's, uh, I mean, why, why would it not work? Um, you know, certainly if you've got more than one, um, window or analytic function in a query, which have the same or similar, uh, they share the same root of the window. I'm not sure why you wouldn't use this, right? Because it just makes things much easier to follow and see. Um, if there's other questions, please put them in the QA window, let us know. I see that someone's there asked- There was one question in, in, in the chat, Chris. Uh, there was a question whether people can get the scripts afterwards. Uh, uh, the classic question. Yes, um, I can. So I can share the scripts to actually do to generate um, these ones here, where I've got in SQL Developer. That's fine. I'll put them in Live SQL or something like that. Um, tweet out the links later. The, uh, the visualization, the OAC thing we've got here. That's um, will we can look into exporting the whole of this project essentially, and um, so you can import it into yours. The there, we've had a so level with you a bit. We've had to do some, some, some bit of smoke and mirrors here. Um, we haven't, it's not quite just like running these queries behind the scenes. We've had to do some stuff. So we get this nice little highlighting um, effects. So you can see which rows are actually included in the results. Um, 
so we will we'll we'll see what we'll do about that but ultimately yes i would like to make this available in some form so you can actually play around and fiddle with it and see what you think you got anything to say on that <laughs> uh, we'll make it work let's, it let's leave it at that we'll make it work yes fair enough yeah good all righty then um so there's no other questions or comments on that one at the moment I'm now going to move on to a slightly different example. So these things that I've shown you so far, so far apply to um, pretty much all the standard aggregate functions. So most of the aggregates, so we've got sum and count here, but also average, um, standard deviation, median, that kind of thing. You can add the over clause and do this partitioning and sorting. So as I said, we could get the ro rolling three-day average or seven-day average. Um, you can get the running total, running average up to now, that kind of thing. So most of the kind of classical stats um, grouping functions, you can just slap an over clause on them and turn them into a window function like this. However, there are a few specific um, analytic functions, ones which you must use this clause for, for them to actually work at all. And I'm just going to cover one in this thing, and that is lag and lead. So this is probably probably the most common one that you'll run into. So with this, we can actually get values from the previous or the next row in the result set. So basically look forwards or back. Hopefully fairly obviously, lag means lag backwards, look backwards in the results. Lead, lead forwards, look forwards in the result set. So get the lag, previous, lead, next. And um, you can see I've actually got two windows here, leveling things up here a bit. Um, you can actually chain many windows. Um, you can have several window clauses that you've defined here. So I've got one which is just a pure sort, either look forwards or backwards, and another one which is partitioning and then sorting. Um, so they have slightly different effects on what we do. The other thing here is, I've got vanilla, plain, lag and lead, and I've also got this by two. So this states an offset of how many rows you want to look forwards or back. So in this case, I'm saying I want to look two rows forward or back as appropriate. So we've got our results there. So let's look and see which rows are included. And we'll start off with plain, lag and lead at the top. So either get the next row, lead, or the previous row, lag. And as you can see, as we work down with our lag and lead, we're getting the row either side of the current in the result set. So I'll work back up again as well. You can see that hopefully nice and easily. We kind of, ooh, nice little effect we have there. With by two, by having this second parameter and setting it to the value two, that means look two rows forward in the result set. So we focus on these two in the middle here. You can see we're jumping two rows forward or back. So it's not until we actually get the th to the third row in the result set that lag by two actually returns, processes anything, fetches anything. We can see it's null in the results here. And again, that kind of moves up and down. So we go wee, up and down through the result set. And then we've got um, including the partition by. So this it works exactly the same way as the previous ones. Split it up into the groups and then find the next or previous row according to the sort. So if we start with our first one, there is you know, nothing before the first one, so lag returns nothing. But leave partition by the next row, the same in the same group, the same value for the group column here is actually row four. So that is the one we include in the results. Um, two and three are in the same uh, group, uh, have the same group column value, same partition. So we can see lead finds that and lag finds it. And then we jump to five as we're leading um, or lags. And of course, six is off in the group on its own. So we can get the result like that. So lag and lead, these are quite useful when you want to do comparisons. You know, what's the percentage or relative increase or decrease compared to last time? You know, how much higher? was sales today than they were yesterday, that kind of thing. Well, how much lower? <laughs> you know, what are they, <laughs> how things are going, right? Um, or you could go back, we could say, um, how many rows? 
Now, the thing with lag and lead is they are always defined in term, terms of a number of rows. We don't have the option to say a range of values. So say, look, seven days previous. If you want to be sure you're always going seven days previous, you've got to be sure you have a row for every single day in your result set. Otherwise, you're going to get some in interesting behavior, right? Let's see Christian nodding that. <laughs> Yeah, don't don't start with financial reporting and missing days. It's it's glorious. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I see. It's, it's some comment lag and lead mostly for academic ranking. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by that, but I think it's like say if you want to. I think day on day, week on week, sale comparisons are particularly useful. I mean, I know. It's something when I when I had a real job in a real code, <laughs> and I actually had to write code and stuff. That that was something the business cared about a lot. You know, show me what is the sales today relative. Well, they tended to care about week on week because day to day, week and weekends have their natural fluctuation. But this Monday we made a million. How does that compare to last Monday? Right? Is that good? Is this good or bad? All right. So, um, I don't know if you've got other examples of that, Christian, or thoughts. Oh, uh, yeah, as I said, in financial reporting, everything, um, every time period there is, uh, every, you know, the, fun, the funny thing always starts when you have companies, I mean, like Oracle, who aren't reporting in, um, you know, a normal calendar, but actually use fiscal calendars. Mm -hmm. So you have uh, standard calendar comparisons and fiscal calendar comparisons all over the place. It, it does become quite tricky as of a certain point in time, especially when then you factor in company, uh, companies working worldwide and not even using the same work week calendar all over the place. So if you compare like, um, uh, let's say the, the Emirates uh, and Europe, um, you do have different work weeks. So you can't even say Saturday, you know, is a day off in some places, Sunday is a day off in some places. <laughs> uh, that's a great Great point. Uh, I, th I think at least once a month, someone asks the question, how do I calculate totals for business days or something like that? And you're like, what's business day? You know, <laughs> Exactly. What's the business day? What's the actual logic? Yes, that's uh, yeah. Yeah. very important information to have before you start these kind of things. Yes, I think my, my, all my, my answer to this is almost always build a table of the dates and have some flags that says, is a working day, is not a working day, or is a company holiday, is a uh, public holiday, a country boats holiday, that kind of thing, because uh, otherwise it's a nightmare. <laughs> Alrighty then, so that in term, that's kind of it that I was going to show in terms of the demo. So if anyone's got any other questions or comments on what I've shown here, um, you want me to recap on any of these, please just say in the comments or say in the Q and A, and we'll address it. There is one important issue which I've sort of hinted at several times, but I haven't really directly addressed properly. Um, and in order to do that, what I will do is I'll go right back up to just our plain order by, where we're including the current row. So let's move back over to this one. So as I was saying, the sort column values are not unique. Um, so if we run this, what this means is for our groups and our range, we actually have several rows which have the same total. So this is interesting for a few reasons. So the first thing is the default is actually this one, range unbounded proceeding. So if I remove that, we will actually get the same results here. That will have the same value. When people ask for running totals, they normally expect the total to increase on for every single row, right? You, people find it a bit surprising generally if many rows have the same running total right um, and this has happened because we've got non-unique values for the sorting here so there's something you need to think about here is in, what is it we actually want to show and you might be wondering well why why did people choose range why is range the default well partly because that's what the sql standard says the sql standard chose range and it's like well why did they choose that well the answer is it's deterministic right it gives the same output or the same this function will give the same results doesn't matter what we're sorting by these other values here so i've just kind of 
conveniently populated things or made things work. So we've always got the ID values going one to six. If you've just sorted by the sort column, there is no guarantee that that will actually happen. You know, particularly this is a complicated query with joins and all sorts of other stuff going on. There is a very, very good chance that these orders, IDs will come out of sequence in some how or another, but the range totals will stay the same. They will stay at six, but our rows total will increase. Um, we can fix this. So range is deterministic, but rows is not deterministic. We might get subtly different row totals here, and depending on how we've actually walked through this result set. So we've got one, three, six here, if it had happened to start with three, it could have been three, what, three, five, six, right? We could have got different results. To avoid this, it's a very good idea to add something unique, like the primary key or a unique key to your sort to avoid this problem. So this is something you've got to think about and know what it is you're trying to show here and why they want this running total and that kind of thing. Because if you just do this, and this, you, you know, these values are not unique. Things might not work quite how you expected them to. So, <laughs> nice little smile from Christian. <laughs> yeah, the not quite was was uh, spot on. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And it, I think the, the the thing with this is as well, it's the kind of thing that if you're not careful with your test data set and ensure you're all covering all possible scenarios. It's the kind of thing that can slip through quite easily and you not actually notice until um, you, you've got your <laughs> do your full live data set and it only crops up in certain circumstances. Okay, so I'm not seeing any other questions or comments at this point. So at this point, I will jump back over to the slides and recap a little bit. So we've looked at kind of how they work and hopefully there's little visualizations of helped you see which rows are included in those totals, depending on what we've selected and what we've shown. Um, so the next question is like, well, what, why, what are these, what's the point of this? Why are we using this? So we've talked a bit about some examples and situations. I'll just kind of recap these to kind of hopefully make them a bit clearer. So to start off, um, one important reason for using SQL analytics or window functions is to avoid self joins or accessing the same table many times in one query. So we've got a kind of a classic beginner error mistake that happens here. We've got um, some table, but we want um, subtotal counts from that table. Now I haven't actually joined it here just to save slight space on the slide, but maybe we want to count up the totals per customer or per product or per country or something like that. A lot of people kind of reach to a subquery like this. And the problem here is, well, we're at least doubling up on the amount of work we're doing, right? You're going to read the same table at least twice. Unfortunately, things could get a lot, lot worse than that, <laughs> significantly worse. Um, I had a session, I think last year, it was a while ago now, where I talked about subqueries and the problems these can cause. But basically, you're at least doubling the work you want to do. And that doesn't sound good. Um, by adding the over clause, we can avoid this problem. So rather than having a subquery, we can then have these totals. And you would typically use this partitioning by customer, partitioning by date, partition by country, whatever it is that you're trying to get these subtotals for while preserving all the original rows. All right, you want to see every single order a customer made along with a count of the number of orders they made that day or that week or something like that. So this is a big reason for using analytic functions, window functions. You can reduce how many times you access a table in a query, um, which can give very considerable performance gains in some cases. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's some nodding there from Christian, right? Um, so you got something you want to say? <laughs> very painful nodding. Yeah, very painful. <laughs> Because I mean, our, our data set here was, was six rows. Uh, if you talk about billions of rows for huge uh, corporations, trust me, the effort and time spent yeah, kind of changes. Yes, <laughs> yes. Okay, so, th so this is a big reason. Um, and I say 
quite often you'll use it just for these totals of partitioning, but there are some cases where you might want to do sorting as well to do things like this. Next thing we're talking about sorting is, as I say, to get things like running totals and moving averages. So this is, you know, get the total count of sales up to over the past week, um, over all time, over whatever the time frame of data that you've actually selected here is. So you can see these running totals. And, you know, some, as I said, most businesses have some kind of, um, I don't know, I can't think of what the word is now. Dis, you know, spread in daily changes. Um, you fluctuation. Know, fluctuation. That's it. Yeah. You know, weekends. Depending, depending whether you're like consumer focused or business focused, weekends could either be your busiest time or your quietest time. And as you, most businesses have some fluctuation on a daily level like that. Um, so you can smooth those things out by taking moving averages, three days, seven days, that kind of thing. And we can define which rows we want to include and show in the row totals like that. So that's quite often just a plain order by, or we might want to do running totals per customer, per day, that kind of thing. Um, and then there's the, like the inter-row comparisons. So this will be typically lag and lead. So when I've got my daily change here, what is um, I've actually split it up by customer ID and taking the daily total and subtracting the previous daily total for that customer. So I can see how much more or less has this customer spent on that day. Um, so we can see the changes there. As, as Christian was saying, very common, very common that people want this in financial reporting. Often, most businesses, I mean, they care about absolute numbers, but it's the actual change that they're more interested in. You know, are we doing better than last week or worse? You know, we need to do that comparison to actually see. Um, so I, I saw there was some stuff flying through in the chat. Was there anything? That yeah, was... before you move on, there was a question uh, whether you would have a practical query example uh, around this whole subquery use case, basically about preventing subqueries. A practical example. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. Let me let me, Joe. Like I say, I did I did a whole session on this, um, like uh, last year sometime. If you go back to the videos tab of Office Hours and search for one that says subqueries, you'll find it. But um, if I just do kind of Windows, so let's say I might have a root column. Actually, no. Problem. So I've got my, I've got some orders here and I've got them for different customers. And I want to see actually when the order, I want to see all the order details here. So um, I want to know when it was placed, what the order status is, that kind of thing. But what I also want to know is how many orders each customer placed, right? So if I go to O, if I go o dot uh, star and count star over. That's my word. So now I can also get the total number of orders the customer has placed. So we can see that. So we get the count per customer. So we can see this person's placed five um, orders, this person's placed two, that person's placed 10, that kind of thing. So this is, uh, again, this is reasonably common that people want to do this kind of thing, or they might want to see. Um, what's the highest total, you know, or the most last date that they placed something, which which was the last location. So, um, as I said, there's lots of situations where you want to see some aggregated value, but the detail of the rows as well. And if I, and I could do it like this, I could do select count from uh, I just typed up the form for some reason. Uh, oh, two. Where we see that customer ID. So that customer ID. Like that. So I could do something like this. But as I say, we're now reading this orders table many times potentially. Right. <laughs> yeah. Please don't. Yeah. <laughs> please don't. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, Oh, is this what we can use for patent matching or finding patterns of purchases? Uh, <laughs> 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 
that's a that's a that's a whole other big topic. Um, there is yeah. actually <laughs> um, a pattern matching clause, so we can do match recognize. Um, if you're interested, we can do a similar session to this, but showing how the match recognize clause processes things. Um, and that allows you to do things like um, split things into groups of consecutive rows, um, find gaps in your data sets, that kind of thing. Um, I, if, if people are interested, let us know and we can, we can do something like that in the future, in a future session. Yeah, <laughs> think about what we did for this one. Uh, visualizing <laughs> the match recognizes like okay, <laughs> that's yeah. kind of fun. So Edith, interestingly, when you add partition by customer ID, the query return the rows ordered by customer ID. So yes, yeah, so that's a very very good observation. And if we actually if we look at the plan very quickly, you should see you'll see window see where it's saying down here window sort. It's actually sorting the rows by that. Uh, this just as, makes it more efficient to calculate those running totals rather than for every customer ID, keeping track of how many you've seen both so far, sort them. So, you know, when you've reached the, a new customer ID, you can, you know, fin you're finished with that calculation, essentially. essentially. Um, so we've got that order by because we're partitioned by it. All right. Okay, um, I will go back to the slides and do a, a quick recap. And we'll, if there's still more questions, we've got a few more minutes we can hang around for, probably. Okay, so there were some use cases, some examples. There are many, many more. People have used these to do all sorts of weird and wonderful things like um, FIFO first in, first out picking operations for warehouses. Once you kind of get a feel for them, understand how they work, they open up all sorts of possibilities. Let's just recap kind of three components for them. So partition by calls, split the rows up into separate groups according to about the, those columns. And the functions will only include rows with the same value for those columns. So if we partition by custom ID, whatever that count or that sum or that average or that max is, it will only consider rows with the same customer ID. So each um, set of rows with the same customer ID is effectively handled separately. So we split them up into groups. We can sort the data with the order by clause to get running totals. So as I said before, the default for this is um, range between um, unbounded preceding and current row. So include all the rows which have a value less than or equal to the current row. If the sorting column is not unique, you will not get strictly increasing values for every single row, okay? Not always what you want. Um, to solve that, either make the sort unique, add the primary key to the end of it or something like that, or um, use the rows frame. But be aware of, with the rows frame, the values then become non-deterministic. If for some reason the query returns the rows in a slightly different order, then you can get different results. Um, then finally, with the order clause, we can define a sliding window, a frame, to define which rows we include or exclude as well. So we can specify that in terms of number of rows. So that is always exactly how many rows or you're going to include, or at most how many rows. A range of values, how many different, um, what's the upper and lower bound of values we're going to include. And as I said, new for 21C, we've got those groups clause. How many uh, unique, different unique values are we going to include? Groups particularly useful when you could have gaps in your sort and you want to include the previous n values, whatever they happen to be, not range of values. And we've got the exclusion syntax. Um, if, if people have got examples they want to share of exclusion, but that's, at least in my opinion, a bit more of a niche example, there's probably some situations where it would be useful. But um, yeah, I personally don't see that many. Um, so, you know, so Chris, just be before yeah. before you go yeah. on, there were two more questions in the Q and A. So the first one is: Can you also explain the functionality of rank function in conjunction with the partition by clause? Yes. Okay. Um, so ranking is sorting row or uh, numbering rows, I should say. Giving actually, uh, I'll probably we can change this here. Rank over partition by customer ID. So this gives um, ascending values, starts at one. Um, actually, I'll start with row number. 
there's three of these, there's row number, rank, and dense rank. Row number is, uh, I need to define that, order by, um, order date time. So you have to specify a sort because we're ranking them, you know, sorting them to the same numeric values. So for each customer, give them a value starting at one um, and saying, uh, you know, one, two, three, four, et cetera. So which, this is the first order, that's the second order, that's the third order for this customer. So we go one, two, three, four, five, and then one, two, and then one, two, three, and that kind of thing. So the num they start at one, they're always consecutive, there's no gaps, the values are all unique. However, with rank, we start at one, but values, rows with the same value get the same rank, okay? So we won't actually see it by customer, we'll do by order status. So what we're saying is um, rank them according to order state, partition by, uh, you know, yes. Yeah. Better think about this now. I want to do it by order status. There we go, and store ID, order by store ID. So there's several rows for each door which have the same status. And you can see ties have the same value. All the cancel row orders for this store um, are at rank one. And then we jump, there's 27 of those rows. So we go to the next row number in the result set, so 28. There's two of these for store and um, five. So we're splitting up by order status and then calculating those. And if you notice, partition by that. So when we get to the complete orders, we start by one. Dense rank is similar to rank, except there are no gaps. So types have the same value, but all the value, all the num numbers are consecutive. So we get one, two, three, four, et cetera. So I hope that answers that and explains that at least in some detail. Um, will the groups clause be backported to 19C? I know of no plans to do that. Um, so I, yeah, I don't know of any plans to do that. <laughs> Valid reason to upgrade. Yeah, yeah, yes. And I found dense rank analyst function in you determine the latest plan year for HR insurance plans and etc. Oh, well, thanks for sharing. Yeah. If you've got if you've got more detail on that, that would be useful, interesting. <laughs> You're looking thoughtful there. Yeah, I'm just thinking about the use case um, for for insurance plans. Yeah, it would be interesting with how, how, how that was used in, in, in detail. Yeah, exactly. Listen, I can see your mind thinking and worrying now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so if you want to know more about this, um, my colleague Connor's got this great free class, Analytic SQL for Developers on Oracle Dev Gym goes in, it's everything I've talked about, plus a lot more, goes into a lot more detail. Um, it's completely free, you just sign up and you your SSO account and watch some videos, take some live SQL scripts, get some quizzes, have some quizzes kind of test you on what you've learned. So it's a great way if you wanna get more in depth about these. Um, and it also covers, there's a whole bunch of other analytic specific functions I haven't talked about at all. Um, it goes into details about those as well. Um, it's window into the world of analytic functions, just kind of an overview of how they work. And if you want to know more about analytics cloud and how that works, we've got some useful information. So the demo portal showing that how it works and an introduction. So that's if you want to understand the tool that I've been using to kind of visualize how that all worked and how fit together. Um, okay, so the insurance plans have the current year and all Yeah, we just said that, yeah. Yeah, well, I used it to partition by plan year. I look at rank two to get prior year. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, interesting. Nice. Yeah, it, it reminds me a lot about um, uh, scenarios in financial calculations when you actually do planning uh, based on, on historical data and then you run several plans and they're all stored in the same place as, as indicated here. So, and then you can switch between them. Mm. Yeah. Can we have links in the chat? Um, I, I'll put them up in a minute, um, they'll also be available on the Office Hours page itself. So if you go back there later, you'll see the links there too. Um, but yes, I'll stick those in the links in the chat. All right, any last comments or questions before we wrap up then? Anything you wanna say, Christian? Or... I just was looking through the other ones, but this is all, no, cool, all good. 
All righty then. My side. <laughs> In that case, um, all that's left to say is really hope you enjoyed this. More importantly, I hope you learned something. Uh, the recording will be available soon, and we hope to see you next time. Cheerio. Mm-hmm.